Hi, my name is Larry Krieger. I've taught American history in urban, rural, and suburban high schools in North Carolina and New Jersey. But you probably know my name or recognize me as the author of a number of AP U.S. history prep books. I'm very proud of the fact that the overwhelming majority of my students have scored fours and fives on their APUSH exams. Now, my mission in creating this video is simple. I hope it will help you enjoy your AP U.S. History course. I also hope it will help you score fours and fives on your APUSH exams. The topic of this video is tobacco and slavery in colonial Virginia. And I'd like to begin our video by introducing you to William Byrd II. His picture is right here on our slide. Doesn't he look supremely confident? Well, he had reason to be confident. Byrd was one of the wealthiest and most influential tobacco planters in colonial Virginia. He lived in a beautiful mansion named Westover. It was located on the James River, midway between Jamestown and Richmond. Now we know a great deal about William Byrd's uh, life and thoughts. He kept a secret diary. And from this diary, we know that he was a very cultured gentleman. He had a library with over 3,500 books. And what's more, he actually read them. Bird spoke Greek, Latin, and in the morning he woke up and he tells us that he wrote selections from the great classics of the Greek historians and the Roman historians. We also know from his diary Byrd's views of his slaves. Sections from the diary indicate that he viewed his slaves as his personal property. In striking passages that are painful for us to read today, Byrd describes how he punished his slaves with whippings and by forcing them to drink their own urine. Well, Bird's life and thoughts raise important questions that we're going to try and answer in this video lesson. First, how did tobacco become a vital cash crop in colonial Virginia? Second, how did slavery become an established part of Virginia's economy and social structure? And finally, how did cultured gentlemen like Byrd reconcile owning slaves with their belief in human liberty. Well, colonial Virginia is important. Virginia was America's largest, most populous, and most influential colony. The topics in this lesson have generated one DBQ, two LEQs, parts of five SAQs, and several multiple choice questions. So let's get started by taking a look at the geographic setting of our lesson. This map directs your attention to the Chesapeake Bay. It stretches about 200 miles from south to north, and is about 20 miles wide. As you can see, it features a jagged coastline with several good harbors, a number of navigable rivers, and fertile land. Two colonies, Maryland in the north and Virginia to the south, bordered the bay. These two colonies are known as the Chesapeake Colony. Now, our focus in today's lesson will actually be on the Tidewater region of eastern Virginia. This region is blessed with fertile land, 
a long growing season, and several wide navigable rivers. The Virginia Company founded Jamestown, which you can see right beside my red dot, in 1607. Their purpose was to make a profit. Now, compare this purpose with the purpose of the founders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Puritans hoped to build a Christian commonwealth, an ideal Christian commonwealth, a city upon a hill. Not the case in Virginia. The purpose was to make a profit. Well, you know, it would seem that uh, this should not be a problem. After all, we've learned that the area had fertile land, a great climate, the Chesapeake Bay was teeming with fish, but the first colonists spent most of their time in a fertile search for gold and silver. Then a short time, disease, malnutrition, and conflicts with Native Americans claimed the lives of about 80% of the first 10,000 colonists. Looked like the Jamestown colony was destined to fail. But then one of the colonists, John Rolfe, who you can see staring out at us from this slide, saved Jamestown. Rolfe was an avid smoker of Indian tobacco. After much experimentation, he learned how to cultivate a sweet strain of tobacco. This strain thrived in Virginia's long growing season and quickly became very popular in England. How popular? Well, just take a look at our bar graph. In 1615, you can, you can even see they produced a couple hundred pounds of tobacco. But look how quickly the production increased. By 1629, Tobacco planters were producing 1.2 million pounds of tobacco, and the number would soar even higher. By 1660, it would reach 10 million pounds a year. That's a lot of tobacco. Now, growing tobacco is not easy. It's a labor-intensive crop. The seeds are very tiny and require precise planting. And of course, depending upon the weather, you'd have to water your new plants. They had to be weeded, and you had to pick off worms from the leaves. Harvesting was a detailed and labor-intensive process. The leaves would be removed from the stalks, then they would be taken to sheds where they would be cured, and finally packed into heavy barrels and loaded onto cargo ships to be exported to England. Well, with a labor-intensive crop, you need labor. Where to find this labor? England did have a surplus of desperate and impoverished young men and women, and Virginia had a growing demand for labor. As you can see on this advertisement, on the right, the London Company advertised, we want settlers to go to Virginia. And look, free land, free ship fare, really? Says all you have to do is sign up and you can work for a Virginia planter. Well, of course, you do have to work, in this case, seven years, to pay back the planter for your fare to Virginia. And the fare would be around six pounds, which was a great deal for impoverished people. But we're promised that after seven years, you'll receive land, clothing, some livestock, and tools. And the advertisement concludes by saying, come, be an indentured servant. Then start a life on your own. In short, Virginia is a land of opportunity. And young men and women, about three-fourths men, one-fourth women, did agree to become indentured servants, work for four to seven years in exchange for their passage across the Atlantic. In 1619, another stream of laborers arrived in Virginia. 
The marker at Jamestown tells us that the first documented Africans in English America arrived at Jamestown in August 1619. We know about the event from a description by John Rolfe. He tells us that the settlers exchanged food for some 20 and odd Negroes. This was a pivotal moment. It marks the beginning of the African experience in British America. But keep in mind that by 1650, Africans comprised just 2% of Virginia's population. It's important to compare indentured servants and African laborers in the early 1600s. Remember, the indentured servants were willing migrants looking for an opportunity. In contrast, the African laborers were unwilling captives kidnapped from their homeland. The indentured servants had a clear and precise legal status. After all, they signed an indenture, a contract. In contrast, the status of the African laborers was very ambiguous. Records indicate that some were treated as indentured servants, but others were treated as slaves. The indentured servants were the major part of the labor force. About 120,000 people migrated to Virginia during the 1600s. Three-fourths, or 90,000, of these settlers were indentured servants. In contrast, African laborers were a marginal part of the colonial Virginia labor force. Now, let's turn to an event that has attracted a great deal of attention from historians and a push exam test writers. It's Bacon's Rebellion. Now, remember those indentured servants who were promised that Virginia would be a land of opportunity. Those who survived quickly became frustrated. Why were they so frustrated? Well, Tobacco prices were falling, taxes were rising, and the good land was being taken over by planters like William Burt. This forced the former indentured servants to move west, where they quickly came in conflict with Native Americans. But that's not all. They had grievances against the Virginia government, led by Governor William Berkeley. He was, to put it mildly, an elitist, and he was also very corrupt. How corrupt? Well, uh, Berkeley's annual income was a thousand pounds. Now recall that the cost of a voyage across the Atlantic was six pounds, and it required four to seven years of labor to pay off that debt. Now this is a volatile situation. And into this volatile situation, we must introduce a young man named Nathaniel Bacon. Now, in truth, Bacon was a planter himself, and he was related to Governor Berkeley. But he's very charismatic, very ambitious. And Bacon saw that he could lead these frustrated, angry, former indentured servants. And so he did. The event is entitled Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon published a statement of his beliefs, and in this proclamation he called for, quote, liberty to all servants and Negroes. Within a short time, he raised an army of several hundred former indentured servants and some Africans. His army slaughtered Indians, plundered Tidewater estates, and believe it or not, burned down Jamestown. In the process of burning down Jamestown, they destroyed 1.2 million pounds of tobacco. You can see the flames rising above the stockade in the homes and Bacon calmly watching. There's no telling 
where Bacon's rebellion would have led. But one month after burning down Jamestown, Bacon suddenly died of dysentery. This robbed his followers of their charismatic leadership. Governor Berkeley promptly seized control of the situation and hung some 23 of the rebels. Well, Bacon's rebellion was a short event, but don't be deceived by its brevity. Bacon's rebellion had important long-term consequences. It persuaded frightened planters to replace unruly and potentially rebellious indentured servants with more easily controlled enslaved Africans. As a result, Bacon's rebellion accelerated the movement to a labor system based upon enslaved Africans. Well, let's return to William Berkeley. Our William Byrd. Now, William Byrd was just two years old in 1676 when Bacon's rebellion erupted across Virginia's Tidewater region. It's important to remember that at that time, enslaved Africans comprised less than 5% of Virginia's population. But that was going to change very rapidly during William Byrd's lifetime. The supply of potential indentured servants from England rapidly diminished. Well, for starters, if you were impoverished and poor, why go to Virginia when you could go to the new colony of Pennsylvania? It offered great fertile soil, much more opportunities. At the same time, Byrd and other Virginia planters became convinced that enslaved Africans were a more economical and less dangerous investment than indentured servants. And so, the number of enslaved Africans began to dramatically increase. You can see in 1680, just four years after Bacon's rebellion, the percent of enslaved Africans stood at just 3%. But 20 years later, it rose to 27%. And at the time of Byrd's death in 1744, over a third of the Virginians were actually enslaved Africans. Now, given the large increase in the population of enslaved Africans, Virginia's planters realized that they needed to end the ambiguity over the status of slavery. In 1705, the Virginia General Assembly passed a series of laws known as the Virginia Slave Code. These laws established slavery as race-based, meaning that blackness equaled slavery. It was permanent and it was hereditary. If your mother was a slave, then you were a slave. The enslaved had few or no civil rights. They couldn't vote, they couldn't hold office, they couldn't serve on juries, and they had very limited and restricted freedom of mobility. The slave code imposed very strict punishments to enforce racial boundaries. For example, if a minister conducted an interracial marriage, he could be fined up to 10,000 pounds of tobacco, a very considerable sum. Well, let's return to Westover, William Byrd's plantation. Now remember, hundreds of slaves worked on Westover. Byrd's diary indicates that he viewed his plantation as a complex what he called machine. And this machine required strict rules to run smoothly. Byrd viewed his slaves as little more than property and it was his duty to carefully supervise and sternly discipline these slaves. But this raises a question. 
We know that Byrd and other leading Virginians were well read, and we know that they boasted that Virginia was, quote, the land of liberty. It was dedicated to protecting individual rights. So how do we explain the fact that Byrd and other planters didn't see a contradiction between their dedication to human liberty and profiting from a system of labor that denied rights and liberty to 40% of the population of their colony. Well, we do know that Byrd and other planters were not entirely comfortable with slavery, but they did not feel responsible for the slave system that they inherited. They demonstrated a lack of moral outrage. Byrd and his fellow planters did not question the morality of slavery, and this lack of moral outrage enabled slavery to grow and endure. The first public denunciation of slavery will not take place until January the 1st, 1831, when William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue of The Liberator. Garrison lambasted slave owners as immoral oppressors, and he called for the immediate and unconditional abolition of slavery. In ringing words, Garrison declared there must be no compromise with slavery, none whatever. Nothing is gained, everything is lost, by subordinating principle to expedience. Well, let's review now. We've covered a lot, and we've attempted to answer those questions that we asked in the beginning of our lesson. Now, let's recall that the Virginia Company founded Jamestown to make a profit. Tobacco provided a valuable cash crop that saved the colony. As demand for tobacco rose, Soaring profits created a pressing need for cheap labor. At first, the Virginia planters relied upon indentured servants. Recall, they signed a fixed term of labor in exchange for their passage across the Atlantic. Also recall that the first Africans arrived in colonial Virginia in 1619 but their legal status remained ambiguous for a long time. Indentured servants dominated Virginia's labor market until after Bacon's Rebellion around 1680. Now, Bacon's Rebellion is short but important. Discontented former indentured servants rebelled against Governor Berkeley's arbitrary and corrupt government. The sudden burst of violence, remember, they ransacked plantations and burned down Jamestown, exposed long simmering tensions between wealthy planters and struggling former indentured servants. Alarmed planters began to replace unruly indentured servants with more easily controlled enslaved Africans. As a result, in the years following Bacon's Rebellion, Virginia transformed from a society with slaves into a society organized around slavery. The 1705 laws sanctioned slavery as a system of race-based, inherited, and perpetual bondage. Now, what caused the development of slavery in Virginia, historians point to a combination of three major causes. First, economic necessity. The colony needed a cash crop to survive. Second, legal codes, which sanctioned slavery as a legal system. And finally, a lack of moral outrage which enabled chattel slavery to develop in colonial Virginia. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video lesson. 
And I also hope that it's achieved my primary goals of helping you enjoy your AP U.S. History class and, of course, helping you earn fours and fives on your APUSH exam. Uh, check out my website, insidertestprep.com. You'll find additional resources, including prep books, practice multiple choice questions, and practice short answer questions. Remember, don't stress, ITP will guide you to success. Thank you again, and I hope you'll join me on future lessons.